the saga of Paul. Tonight, looking at Acts chapter 26, verses 24 through 32, almost believing, almost believing is not enough. Take your Bibles and turn with me, if you will, back to that portion of Scripture. We're going to review briefly verses 1 through 23, which was Paul witnessing in court. You remember we spent two weeks on that. And the Apostle Paul, as he always did, everywhere he went, made the proclamation of the gospel the key issue. Every time we hear Paul speaking in the book of Acts, he's presenting Christ. We expect that in all of his epistles, though they are written to believers, but he does present the gospel even in his epistles, which are written to believers, because there will be those in the churches where the epistles are sent who are not saved. And although he covers a great deal of doctrinal truth in the epistles, he also presents the gospel. We see that in Romans chapter 1, verses 1 through 4, the opening verses. We see that in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verses 1 through 4. We find that the Apostle Paul talks about the fruit of the Spirit and our position in Christ over in the book of Galatians, but he also presents the gospel. Every place you look, Paul is presenting the gospel, but in the book of Acts, it is very important to notice that every time he speaks to a group of unbelievers or to an individual who is an unbeliever, his focus is on the gospel. We should keep that in mind because we come in contact with unsaved people every day. Every one of us here at some point will run into an unbeliever almost every day unless we simply sit home and never go out. We'll run into those people who don't know Christ. People whom someday we will give an account for the interaction that we had with those people when we had the opportunity to share Christ. And so tonight as we think about what Paul was doing, witnessing in court, but then having a specific reaction. He witnessed, but the person didn't believe. Does that mean what Paul did, it was worthless? Does that mean that he should have done something else? That he should have used a, a logical argumentation or something else? No, Paul preached the truth on how to be saved. You'll not always get the same reaction when you proclaim the gospel. We're going to talk about the different reactions that Paul got as he moved through the book of Acts. But we have a very sad reaction that's given to us here. But let's back up for the beginning of this. Let's look at the first 23 verses here. Agrippa has given Paul permission to speak for himself. Paul doesn't have to hire an outside lawyer. Paul speaks for himself. And so... Paul is very excited about talking to King Agrippa because he knows that King Agrippa knows the Old Testament law. King Agrippa knows the Old Testament prophets. King Agrippa knows the Old Testament writings. He knows the Tanakh, the Torah, the Nevi'im, the Ketuvim. And so here's a man who has a background that the Apostle Paul can use to build on. He's going to talk to him a little bit differently than when he presents the gospel to those who are totally pagans, as we find in Acts chapter 17. But here's a man who knows, a man who's married to a Jewess, a man who will understand, but a man who has other priorities. That's a very sad thing. When you have priorities other than God and his word. I think that many of us here have priorities that at least sometimes we hold higher than God and his word. So Paul says, I think myself happy, King Agrippa, because I shall answer for myself this day before thee, touching all things whereof I am accused of the Jews, especially because I know thee to be an expert in all the customs and questions which are among the Jews. Wherefore, I beseech thee to hear me patiently. And he goes through a brief history of his life. He calls on the Sanhedrin to be his witnesses, though they will not. And then he talks about the resurrection. The resurrection is always central in Paul's presentations of the gospel, because without the resurrection, there is no hope. If Jesus is still dead in some tomb over in Palestine somewhere, you and I are wasting our time tonight. We might as well be 
back home watching TV. I don't have a TV, but I suppose if the gospel weren't true, <laughs> I'd buy myself a TV. Without the resurrection, there is no hope. Paul speaks about the heavenly vision that he received after he had been persecuting the believers. And then he talks about how he was caught in the temple and the Jews were about to try to kill him. And then God helped him. Now, if you think back on when the Jews caught him in the temple, it seems to be a Roman centurion who rescued him. But Paul looks at it as divine intervention. A very important principle that I learned a long time ago is God doesn't have to send angels to deliver us. God doesn't have to crack the earth open and swallow our adversaries. The normal means that God uses is God uses people. That means he can use you. That means he can use me. God sometimes uses people who are not believers to be of assistance to us. God sometimes uses people who are believers. I know of one situation where I'd locked myself out of the car and God sent a, a policeman along who had uh, one of those Jimmy sticks. And you know what? He opened the car door for me, did not try to take a bribe from me for having done it. And he was not a believer. God uses people who are not believers often to minister to those who are believers. Do you take opportunity to witness? I did. He wanted to get out of there pretty quick. <laughs> it's all right. When God sends an unbeliever your way and is of assistance to you, one of the best things you can do to say thank you to them is tell them how to escape eternal damnation. Theirs is but a little kindness compared with the great kindness that you offer. Therefore obtained I help of God, and I continue unto this day witnessing, both the small and great, saying none other things than those which the prophets and Moses did say should come, that Christ should suffer, and that he should be the first that should rise from the dead, and should show light unto the people and to the Gentiles. He's got a mixed audience. He covers everybody. To the people, that's the Jews, and to the Gentiles, that's the Romans that are standing around who actually have him incarcerated at this time. Paul was sharing the gospel of Christ. The principal thing, always appropriate in every situation, never forget that when you're under pressure to compromise, never forget that when it's politically correct to keep your mouth shut, someday and perhaps soon, some of us will be dragged into court for taking a biblical stand and for witnessing. Never forget, I need to say this to myself, never forget that my principal responsibility is to witness in every context. It might be a witness to someone who's lost. It might be a witness to someone who's saved, who needs to be kept from sin. We don't like those kinds of scenarios either. You may be the only presentation of the gospel that someone hears. For as much as ye are manifestly declared to be the epistle of Christ ministered by us, written not with ink, but with the spirit of the living God, not in tables of stone, but in fleshly tables of the heart. Is the handwriting of the spirit of God in your life smudged so that people can't read it? Have you wrinkled your sheet of paper so badly that it's hard to make out what the letters are? that the Spirit of God has been trying to write in your heart? Have you allowed the devil to mess it up, or the flesh, or the world? Because Satan doesn't want them to read it. In fact, that's what Paul says in the next verse, in whom the God of this world hath blinded the minds of them which believe not, lest the light of the glorious gospel of Christ, who is the image of God, should shine unto them. As we said last week, you have nothing to be ashamed about, and so you have every motive for witnessing. If you're ashamed of Jesus when things are easy, 
or if you're ashamed of believers who are suffering for their faith when things are easy you will definitely be ashamed of Jesus when the going gets tough if you're ashamed of Jesus he will be ashamed of you if you're faithful he will never be ashamed of you and we read the verses on that if you grow to spiritual maturity God is delighted to own you as his children that's why he leads us through the wilderness that's why we were talking about this morning he is design is to bring us through the difficult times so that we'll learn to trust him and as we grow he is delighted to call us his children it's a dangerous thing to be ashamed of Christ and that brings us to tonight believing almost is not enough we're in verse 24 and as he thus spake for himself Festus said with a loud voice Paul thou art beside thyself much learning doth make thee mad but he said I am not mad most noble Festus but speak forth the words of truth and soberness for the king knoweth of these things before whom also I freely speak for I am persuaded that none of these things are hidden from him for this thing was not done in a corner three years Jesus had walked on earth bearing his testimony making it clear who he was healing those who were diseased raising those who were dead shutting down all the religious hypocrites who claimed to be representing God and Jesus was crucified King Agrippa would have known all these things it was public Jesus had spent his time not merely in Jerusalem but he had spent his time all over the country and he had gone across the river into the Decapolis Paul speaks the truth the king knoweth of these things before whom also I freely speak so in other words Festus you're new on the scene you don't understand everything's going on but Agrippa does understand everything that I'm saying he knew his audience King Agrippa now here we get to the heart of the matter after Paul has given those first 23 verses of his testimony before King Agrippa and then Festus interrupts in verse 24 Paul answers him briefly but then Paul turns back to his principal target Festus has already hardened his heart Festus has already refused to believe Festus has already rejected testimony which he has heard because after Festus heard he decided to send him up to Jerusalem and Paul appealed to Caesar and so Festus conferred with the council which means they had heard too and they said well I guess we're between a, a rock and a hard place we got to send him but we got to figure out what we're gonna say when we send him that's why we're having the trial here in front of King Agrippa and now we get to the sad part King Agrippa believest thou the prophets when we went through the Gospel of Luke and we studied that portion where Jesus is on the road to Dema uh, road to Emmaus with the two whom I believe were his uncle and aunt their eyes were holden they did not know him they told him about why they were sad and Jesus had responded to them oh fools and slow of heart to believe all that the prophets have spoken King Agrippa believest thou the prophets and then it says and beginning at Moses and all the prophets Jesus expounded unto them in all the scriptures the things concerning himself and at that point we went through every book of the Old Testament and pointed out the portions of each book in the Old Testament every one that points to the Lord Jesus Christ 
We didn't look at all the prophecies, but we looked at at least one or two in every one of the books of the Old Testament. Do you believe the prophets? Do we believe the prophets? We claim to believe the prophets. The prophets wrote not only of the first coming of Christ, the prophets wrote of the second coming of Christ also. And yet we often live as though we only believe what the prophets said about the first coming of Christ. Believest thou the prophets? I know that thou believest. Paul knew something about Agrippa. Paul knew more than one thing about Agrippa. Paul also had supernatural insight granted by the Holy Spirit, just like Peter did when Peter challenged Simon Magus and said, you're in the gall of bitterness. Repent, or these things are going to come upon you. Agrippa was a man who knew, who understood, who believed in his head, but it never translated to his heart. That's what Paul says. King Agrippa, believest thou the prophets? I know. Not I guess, not I hope. I know that thou believest. But then Agrippa's response in verse 28. Then Agrippa said unto Paul, Almost. Oh, what a painful word. Almost thou persuadest me to be a Christian. Agrippa had been paying attention while Paul was preaching. Festus was beginning to sweat a little bit and getting embarrassed by what Paul was saying, but Agrippa had been listening. Almost thou persuadest me. Now we need to ask a question when we look at that word almost. Does that mean that Paul's logic wasn't good enough? Does that mean that Paul didn't use enough exciting illustrations of repentant drunkards crawling to the front to the altar? Did that mean that the, the soft music wasn't playing when it was supposed to be playing? No, because the issue of salvation, as we saw this morning, is an issue determined by God, and yet we are held accountable. Paul said enough that God could have used it to draw Agrippa to Christ. Agrippa saw the light. Agrippa saw the open door. Agrippa walked to the open door. Agrippa glanced around. And then Agrippa stepped back from the open door. We might fault him for doing that until we discover that's exactly what we often do. When we hear the word of God, when we know the word of God, when we know the will of God, we step to the door, we look around, and we decide, I have a reason not to walk through the door, which is the center of God's will. Almost thou persuadest me to live a holy life. Almost thou persuadest me to obey the word of God. Almost thou persuadest me to walk in the spirit. Almost thou persuadest me to be the right kind of husband. Almost thou persuadest me to be the right kind of wife. Almost thou persuadest me to honor my father and my mother. Almost thou persuadest me. Oh, I'm going to trample on toes. To come to all the services and be on time. 
almost. Almost is not enough. And Paul said, I would to God that not only thou, but also all they that hear me this day were both almost and altogether such as I am, except these bonds. Paul didn't say, I wish you could be in chains like me and then you'd get it. If you just got locked up for a while and had people using you as a political pawn, then you'd understand what I'm saying and you'd get it. Boy, I sure wish you were chained up because if you were chained up and I was in control, you know what would happen? Paul didn't wish evil even on his captors, even on those who were abusing him legally, even on those who ultimately would send him to Rome, even on those who had you know, toyed with the idea of sending him back to Jerusalem so that he could get assassinated on the way. Paul says, no, I'm talking about eternal things. I wish that you were altogether such as I am, except for these bonds, that you knew that you had eternal life, that you understood and believed with all your heart and trusted in the risen Christ, because then you'd be safe. Almost is not enough. At that point, Agrippa begins to feel the pressure. Festus had felt it earlier when he interrupted Paul. And when he had thus spoken, the king rose up. In other words, this is over. And the governor, that's Festus, and Bernice, that's the wife of many men that we've talked about. Happened to be hooked up with King Agrippa right at this point. And they that sat with them, when the king gets up and walks out, everybody else does too. And when they were gone aside, they talked between themselves, saying, This man doeth nothing worthy of death or of bonds. Nothing. So why didn't they let him go? Why didn't they let him go? They use a technicality of the law. Verse 32. Then said Agrippa unto Festus, This man might have been set at liberty if he had not appealed unto Caesar. Now let's stop and think about that for a minute. Do you think there might have been something in Roman law such as Paul withdrawing his appeal so that they could have set him at liberty. Yes, they didn't have this discussion in front of Paul, but the Holy Spirit made sure that Luke recorded it. Because it says when they were gone aside, they talked between themselves. They could have resolved that issue, but they were playing politics because they had not only Paul, they had the Jews they had to deal with. What they're doing is rationalizing an excuse for doing what they know is wrong. You and I often do that too, don't we? We rationalize an excuse even when we know that what we're doing is wrong, but this gives us a little bit of salve on our conscience so that we can go ahead and complete what we are planning to do, they hadn't done it yet. They could have stopped at this point, but they wanted so badly to get Paul out of there so they didn't have to deal with their real problem, which was the Jews who wanted him dead. Agrippa is the one that makes that comment. Agrippa is the one who knows what Paul has said is true. Agrippa is the one who just made the comment, you almost persuade me to be a Christian. In other words, Paul, you've got a very powerful argument. But Agrippa wasn't going to get himself caught in that net. He understood the Jews very well. Paul himself said so. 
He would rather have personal peace and prosperity than deal with the issues. How many times do we do that? Personal peace, personal prosperity. You know, Agrippa is dead today. He lasted a few more years, as did Bernice until she got killed in the explosion of Vesuvius. They lost their chance. You and I are losing chances every day. We are losing opportunities to do right. We're making excuses for why we don't do right. I don't know what yours are. I don't know what your opportunities were or what your excuses are. doesn't matter. You know what they are. The Holy Spirit can convict you just like he does me. Why didn't I take advantage of that opportunity? Now let's talk about the different responses to the gospel. Presenting the gospel, which Paul has just done, has produced a response in verses 24 through 32. It's produced a response from Festus. In fact, a loud voice response. It says Festus said with a loud voice. He didn't just say, whisper it. He didn't nudge Paul and say, look, cool it, Paul. That's kind of weird what you're saying. It produced a response from Festus. It produced a response from Agrippa. It produced a response for the other people who were sitting there and listening. They didn't say a word. They just got up and walked out. Did you know that every time you share the gospel of Christ, it will produce a response? I shared one response with you a couple of weeks ago when I told you how Judy and I had gone to the home of one of our Ulpan teachers, who today is a member of the Knesset, a lovely young lady, daughter of a rabbi, an orthodox rabbi. She would baked us a, a cake on a hot plate. Believe it or not, they can do that. And we sat and talked about the Messiah until after midnight. And I said to her, Dahlia, I said tonight you're going to make a decision. Either you will decide to trust Jesus as your Messiah or you will make the decision to put it off. Or you will make the decision to outright reject him. But you will make a decision tonight. She sat there with her head tipped forward and tears streaming down her cheeks. So after a few more minutes, Judy and I got up and left and had to walk several miles to get back because all the buses were stopped at that point. The next day she came up to Judy and she said, the words that Christians spoke, they were beautiful words. Almost believing is not enough. Presenting the gospel always produces a response one way or the other. The first thing we see very clearly here in our passage is the response of embarrassment, especially if it's in public. That's what we have here in our text. Festus is being apologetic that he has made Agrippa come and listen to Paul. And so he tries to defend himself by saying, Paul, you're nuts. Much learning doth make thee mad. Everybody knew Paul was a scholar. But Festus is saying, well, what that's done to you, it's fried your brains. Embarrassment. The second thing is mockery. That's another response to the gospel. Some of that is present here also because what he's doing when he says, Paul, you're crazy, he's mocking Paul. Anger is another response to the gospel. Some of that's present also because as he publicly denounces Paul, we see some people will also react with anger and violence. 
There are many illustrations of that, obviously, in Paul's ministry. For example, back in chapter 14, you recall, it says it came to pass in Iconium that they both went together into the synagogue of the Jews, and so spake that a great multitude, both of Jews and also of Greeks, believed. But the unbelieving Jews stirred up the Gentiles and made their minds evil affected against the brethren. Long time, therefore, abode they speaking boldly in the Lord, which gave testimony unto the word of his grace, and granted signs and wonders to be done by their hands. But... The multitude of the city was divided, part held with the Jews, part with the apostles. And when there was an assault made, both of the Gentiles and also of the Jews with their rulers, to use them despitefully and to stone them, do you think there were some mad people? <laughs> they could accuse Paul of being mad, crazy. But here are some people who are mad, mad. They were going to try to catch him and stone him. Now, it did happen to Paul in another place. When they were aware of it, they fled unto Lystra and Derby, cities of Lacaonia, and unto the region that lieth round about, and there they preached the gospel. What were they doing? All of this, Paul's preaching the gospel. Every place he goes, there is a different response to the gospel. If you are getting no response ever, it means you are not doing what? Not, come on, not witnessing, not proclaiming the gospel. If you never get any positive response or negative response, it means you are not giving the message that causes the offense, the offense of the cross. To the Jews, it's a stumbling block. To the Gentiles, it's foolishness. If you never get any response from anybody, it may mean that you're not communicating the gospel of Christ. There they preached the gospel, and there sat a certain man of Lystra, impotent in his feet, being a cripple from his mother's womb, who had never walked. The same heard Paul speak, who steadfastly beholding him and perceiving that he had faith to be healed, said with a loud voice, Stand upright on the feet. He leaped and walked. When all the people saw what Paul had done, they began to shout and scream and say, Hey, the gods have come down to us. And they called Paul Jupiter and uh, or Barnabas Jupiter and Paul Mercurius because he was the chief speaker. And so they began to try to sacrifice. The priest of Jupiter came out and said, man, we're going to take advantage of this. They're going to sacrifice to Paul and to Barnabas. Paul and Barnabas said, don't do it. We're men of like passions with you. We preach unto you that you should turn from these vanities. Ooh, they just attacked the priests who were going to honor them. They called that vanity. Turn to the living God which made heaven and earth and the sea and all the things that are therein. Yep, there you are, creationism who in times past suffered all nations to walk in their own ways. But he left not himself without witness in that he did good and gave us rain from heaven and fruitful seasons, filling our hearts with food and gladness. In other words, there's a true God out there. Forget these guys who are running around with garlands. They scarce restrained the people. And there came certain Jews from Antioch and Iconium who persuaded the people and, having stoned Paul, drew him out of the city, supposing he was dead. Do some people get mad when you preach the gospel? When you tell them that their gods are no gods? When you tell them that the things that are at the center of their lives are not worthy to be worshipped, not worthy to be coveted after, not worthy to be adored, not worthy to spend all their time on? Do they get mad? Yes, they do. In fact, here they killed Paul. I think this is what Paul's talking about when he talks about, I knew a man who was caught up to the third heaven, and saw things that he can't talk about. They'll try to kill you, folks. You just wait. You proclaim the gospel, and you proclaim it faithfully, and you don't change it, and you insist on it every time you talk to these people. They'll get tired of it. And then it says, as Paul rose up, they went back to Lystra, Iconium, and Antioch, confirming the souls of the disciples and exhorting them to continue in the faith. And, listen, this wasn't just for them. And that we must, through much tribulation, enter into the kingdom of God. This morning we talked about it in terms of wilderness wanderings. We talked about God leading them into the wilderness. We talked about it in the context of spiritual warfare. We find the same thing going on here when the Apostle Paul has just demonstrated what may happen to us.
over in chapter 19, five chapters later. Paul's been preaching the gospel. And it says, in the same time, there arose no small stir about that way. Remember, he had just attacked the priests of Jupiter back here in chapter 14. Now he's going to attack Diana of the Ephesians. A certain man named Demetrius, a silversmith, which made silver shrines for Diana, brought no small gain unto the craftsmen. Ah, there's another motive, too whom he called together with the workmen of like occupation and said, Sirs, you know that by this craft we have our wealth. Do you want to be rich or do you want to be poor? Hey, I want to be rich. All in favor of being rich, raise your right hand. Yes. Did you know there's a guy in town who is going to make you into a pauper? What? But we've got to have a religious reason for what we're going to do. Because after all, you know, uh, economic free market here, we, we've got to make sure that we have a religious reason for stopping what he is doing. Moreover, you see in here that not alone at Ephesus, but almost out through all Asia, this Paul hath persuaded and turned away much people, saying that they be no gods which are made with hands. Oh, they understood the message. So that not only our craft is in danger to be set at naught, why just think about that, we won't have any work to do, but also that the temple of the great goddess of Diana should be despised and her magnificence should be destroyed, whom all Asia and the world worshipeth. Well, a little bit of exaggeration. And when they heard these sayings, they were full of tickly happy skipping through the tulips, right? <laughs> they were full of wrath. Preaching the gospel and making it clear that Jesus must replace everything else everything it produces wrath they cried out saying great is Diana of the Ephesians the third response that sometimes we see is envy sometimes people who are jealous of your success in preaching the gospel will do what they can to destroy you out of envy that's what happened to Thessalonica when Paul preached in Thessalonica chapter 17 now, when they had passed through Amphipolis and Apollonia, they came to Thessalonica, where a synagogue of the Jews was. And Paul, as his manner was, went in unto them, and three Sabbath days reasoned with them out of the Scriptures. Remember, we talked about Paul's approach, going to the synagogues first. He had a foundation upon which to build. He had a foundation even with Agrippa in our chapter tonight, because Agrippa knew what the Jews believed. Here's Paul at Thessalonica, opening and alleging that Christ must needs have suffered and risen again from the dead. That's at the center of every one of Paul's messages. And that this Jesus whom I preach unto you is Christ. And some of them believed and consorted with Paul and Silas. And of the devout Greeks, a great multitude. And of the chief women, not a few. Ooh, we find people believing. Do you know what that did with the rest? It tells you in verse 5. But the Jews which believed not moved with envy. Sometimes when you preach the gospel, it raises up envy. Envy is different than jealousy. Jealousy is when you want what somebody else has and you try very, very hard to get it, but you can't get it. Envy is when you want what somebody else has and because you can't get it, you will destroy them. It says these people were moved with envy. They took unto them certain lewd fellows of the baser sort, gathered a company, and set all the city in an uproar, and assaulted the house of Jason, and sought to bring them out of the people. Envy. And when they found them not, they drew Jason and certain of the brethren under the rulers of the city, crying, These that have turned the world upside down are come hither also, whom Jason hath received. And these do all contrary to the decrees of Caesar, saying that there is another king, one Jesus. Well, they sort of got their theology straight and sort of mixed. And they troubled the people and the rulers of the city when they heard these things. And when they had taken security of Jason, it cost him money. And of the other, they let them go. That was probably Jason's wife. They had to pay a big fine. But this wouldn't happen again. Response to the gospel may cost not only you, but somebody else something. The response may be envy. Another response, and of course this is portrayed in some of these first responses, but it's the response of persecution. Since the gospel changes lives, you see, begin to understand why Agrippa said, almost you persuade me to be a Christian, but I really don't want to go there. Because these are the responses that we see to the gospel. The thing was not done in the corner. 
Agrippa knew about Jesus. Agrippa probably knew about John the Baptist. Agrippa knew what happened to John the Baptist. Agrippa knew what happened to Jesus. Agrippa has heard the reports of Paul going around the countryside. Agrippa is following what's going on. He knows what the Jews are doing. And he's saying, I really don't want to go there. You see, since the gospel changes lives, people who lose money will persecute and seek to stop you. For example, like closing down a bar because the former drunks got saved and now there's nobody that comes to the bar. You know, that kind of thing happens. Saw that up in Boston going on when we had the rescue mission operation up there. You know, we were opposed by the bartenders because their very habitual faithful customers got saved and they were going broke just like the silversmiths in Ephesus. Here's another case of where they were losing money and so they raised up persecution. It came to pass as we went to prayer a certain damsel possessed with a spirit of divination met us which brought her masters much gain by soothsaying. You see the world has a different God. It wasn't that Diana the Ephesians was so great, but they made silver shrines and they sold silver shrines and they were going to lose their money. Same thing here with the, the girl who did fortune telling. Brought her masters much gain by soothsaying. The same followed Paul and us and cried, saying, These men be of the servants of the Most High God, which show unto us the way of salvation. And this she did many days. But Paul, being grieved, turned and said unto the Spirit, I command thee in the name of Jesus Christ to come out of her. And he came out the same hour. And when her masters saw that the hope of their gains was gone. <sighs> what money will do to move people? They caught Paul and Silas and drew them into the marketplace under the rulers and brought them unto the magistrates saying, you know, this isn't the real charge, is it? None of these things that people bring up are the real charges. They keep saying that these guys are committing treason, that these guys aren't obeying the laws of Rome, that these guys are causing trouble in town. These guys have turned the world upside down every place else. They've come here. Their real reason was it's cost us some money. These men, being Jews, throw in a little racism here, do exceedingly trouble our city and teach customs which it is not lawful for us to receive. Oh, really? Neither to observe. Oh, really? Being Romans. Pull the race card. And the multitude rose up together against them, and the magistrates ran off their clothes. They didn't even find out what he was talking about and commanded to beat them. And when they had laid many stripes upon them, they cast them into prison, charging the jailer to keep them safely. Well, you know the rest of the story. And the Philippian jailer gets saved at the end. God allowed them to go through the wilderness because there was a man who needed to be rescued on the other side of the wilderness. Another response is delay, which is certainly what's going on here. King Agrippa and Festus rise up. They delay. Sometimes put, people put it off for ulterior motives. We've seen that already with Felix over in chapter 24. Felix wanted to bribe money business again. You know, money, covetousness is idolatry, and the covetous man is an idolater. Felix wanted to bribe, and Felix also wanted to be politically correct. Chapter 24. When Felix heard these things, having more perfect knowledge of that way, he knew just like Agrippa knew. You and I know a lot of stuff about the Bible. We know a lot of things that God wants us to do. But we rationalize and make excuses which sound good on paper so that we can still do what's sinful. Having more perfect knowledge of that way he deferred them. People put off the reception of Christ because they have ulterior motives. But he makes a reasonable excuse. When Lysias, the chief captain, shall come down, I will know the uttermost of your matter. And he commanded the centurion to keep Paul and let him have liberty because he knew he wasn't guilty. And that he should forbid none of his acquaintances to minister or come to him. And after certain days, when Felix came with his wife to Silla, which was a Jewess. <laughs> oh, boy. These guys are in hot water. They had so much light 
and they kept pushing it away. Have you ever done that? I know you have, because I have. I'm human, you're human. God gives us light and we choose the wrong path. We see the light is going down that path and we sort of see something twinkling in the darkness that we think is maybe a diamond down the dark path. And so we leave the bright path and what is, is down there is not a diamond, but it's the eyes of a lion that were reflecting a little bit of that glint of light. You've been there. I've been there. He sent for Paul and heard him concerning the faith in Christ. What was Paul doing with Felix? He was witnessing. He was sharing the gospel. And as he reasoned of righteousness, temperance, and judgment to come, Felix trembled and answered, Go thy way for this time. When I have a convenient season, I will call for thee. Let's put it off. Another day. Let's put it off. Another day. Let's put it off. Another day. Oh, and there was another reason. He hoped also that money should have been given him by Paul that he might lose him, wherefore he sent for him the oftener and communed with him. Paul could have gotten out just by paying a bribe. But you know, God had already told Paul, I'm going to have you go even before Caesar. I'm going to take you all the way to Rome. So Paul didn't worry about it because Paul knew he was headed for Rome. If you'd had the money, would you have bought your way out and said, man, I want to get out of this place? Especially in light of what we know now that we're down in chapter 26. That was back in chapter 24. Did you know that's one of the reasons that Bible-believing mission boards never pay a ransom for their missionaries when their missionaries get kidnapped? They don't pay. And the missionaries know that. So if they get caught by Muslim terrorists or by someone else, they know the mission board is not going to pay to get them free. Good illustration is Paul here. Wherefore he sent for him the oftener and communed with him. I wonder how many times Paul spoke with Felix. Apparently often because he did it for two years. After two years Portius Festus came into Felix's room and Felix, ah, another motive, willing to show the Jews a pleasure, left Paul bound. Sometimes people put off the reception of the gospel for ulterior motives. We have a whole list of ulterior motives here. Sometimes there are a lot of different responses. In Acts chapter 17, we find the Apostle Paul speaking on Mars Hill. They took him, brought him to the Areopagus, saying, May we know what this new doctrine is whereof thou speakest, for thou bringest certain strange things to our ears. We would know, therefore, what these things mean. They were interested. It's a receptive audience. They want to hear and understand. For the Athenians and strangers which were there spent their time in nothing else but to either tell or to hear something new. Then Paul stood in the midst of Mars Hill and said, You men of Athens, I perceive that in all things you are too superstitious. For as I passed by and beheld your devotions, I found an altar with this inscription, To the unknown God, whom therefore you ignorantly worship, him declare I unto you. God that made the world. He starts with creation because he's got a pagan audience. He doesn't start with the, the Old Testament prophets as he did with King Agrippa because these are pagans who've never heard it. He starts with creation. That's where we have to start, too, when we're trying to witness to our society. And their minds have been blinded by Darwin. God that made the world and all things therein, seeing that he is Lord of heaven and earth, dwelleth not in temples made with hands, neither is worshipped with men's hands, as though he needed anything, seeing he giveth life and breath and all things, and hath made of one blood all nations of men, for to dwell on all the face of the earth. There is one race, it's the human race and hath determined the times before appointed in the bonds of their habitation, that they should seek the Lord, if happily they might feel after him and find him, though he be not be far from every one of us. For in him we live and move and have our being, as certain also of your own poets have said, for we are also his offspring. For as much then as we are the offspring of God, we ought not to think that the Godhead is like unto gold or silver or stone, graven by art and man's device. Here he's attacking, again, the pagan philosophies and gods around him. But we have a mixed response. 
The times of this ignorance God winked at, but now commandeth all men everywhere to repent, because he hath appointed a day in the which he will judge the world in righteousness by that man whom he hath ordained, whereof, ha, here we have it. He's given assurance unto all men in that he hath raised him from the dead. You see, the resurrection is at the heart of every one of Paul's messages as you go through Acts. Now here's your mixed response. And when they heard of the resurrection of the dead, some mocked. Huh, that was one of the responses we saw earlier, wasn't it? Mocking. Others said, we will hear thee again of this matter. There were some who were being drawn, but had not yet believed. So Paul departed from them. But there were some who didn't delay it. Howbeit certain men clave unto him and believed, among which was Dionysius the Areopagite and a woman named Damaris and others with them. The right response, which we see in that last verse, is the response to salvation. There are many responses to the gospel, but only one of them counts. In Acts 16, a vision appeared to Paul in the night. There stood a man of Macedonia and prayed him, saying, Come over into Macedonia and help us. Now, remember, it was a man that appeared in the vision. But the first convert's going to be a woman. After he had seen the vision, immediately we endeavored to go into Macedonia, assuredly gathering that the Lord had called us that to preach the gospel unto them. Therefore, loosing from Troas, we came with a straight course to Samothracia, and the next day to Neapolis, and from thence to Philippi, which is the chief city of that part of Macedonia and a colony. And we were there in that city abiding certain day. And on the Sabbath, we went out of the city by a riverside where prayer was wont to be made, and we sat down and spake unto the women which resorted thither. A man of Macedonia appeared in the vision, come over and help us. And God sent Paul to a woman. We spake unto the women which resorted thither, and a certain woman named Lydia, a seller of purple of the city of Thyatira. And oh, you should read what is said in the book of Revelation about Jesus' letter to Thyatira. Some bad things happened in Thyatira. Lydia, which worshiped God, heard us. And here we get back to where does salvation come from? Whose heart the Lord opened, that she attended unto the things which were spoken of Paul. And when she was baptized and her household, there's a household salvation here. She besought us saying, if you have judged me to be faithful to the Lord, Come into my house and abide there. And she constrained us. This message was entitled, Almost Believing is Not Enough. We see the different responses, some of which are anger and outright rejection, some of which are persecution, some of which are murder, some of which are delay, some of which are hesitation and political correctness. But we see some who believe. Almost believing is not enough. Now is the day of salvation. Almost is not enough. Second Corinthians 6, 1 and 2. We then as workers together with him beseech you also that ye receive not the grace of God in vain. For he saith, I have heard thee in a time accepted, and in the day of salvation have I succored thee, that means helped thee. Behold, now is the accepted time. Behold, now is the day of salvation. Almost is not enough. Delaying for whatever ulterior motive will not work. Now is the accepted time. Now is the day of salvation. Do you know for sure that if you died tonight that you would be in heaven? Yes. 
The Bible teaches absent from the body, present with the Lord. That's only for believers. Might be somebody here tonight that's never truly trusted Christ. You're counting on something else. You're counting on the works of the law. You're counting on your good deeds. You're counting on something that you have done. Don't delay. Felix delayed. Festus delayed. Agrippa delayed. Bernice delayed. The council delayed. Today they're in hell. You don't want to go there. Perhaps there's someone in the internet audience that has never trusted Jesus Christ. You've heard tonight that Jesus Christ, who died for your sins and was buried and rose again the third day, will give you eternal life as a free gift if you trust him alone. Don't say, I'm going to wait and think about it. Don't say, well, what's in it for me? Will it make me rich? If I become a Christian, will I become successful? If I become a Christian, will I get the things that I want? If I become a Christian, can I manipulate God and, and have him give to me whatever it is that you want? You will make a decision tonight, just like I told Dahlia. You will make a decision to believe and receive the gift of eternal life. Or you will make a decision to delay and put it off and you may never come to Christ. Or you will make a decision to reject. And rejection manifests in many ways we've seen tonight. Anger, jealousy, hatred, murder, the works of the flesh, basically. But someday you will stand before God and you will give an account. Our gracious Heavenly Father, how we thank you for your word and for the free offer of the gospel. How we thank you that the gospel is the good news that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures and that he was buried and that he rose again the third day according to the scriptures. The gospel is not what we do. The gospel is what you have already done. We merely respond to the gospel. How we respond shows the condition of our heart. Father, for those who are believers here, we respond to you in many areas of life. We've already responded with salvation. We've already responded in faith. Now the question is, will we respond in obedience to what you have laid out clearly in your word for us to do that we might glorify Christ? Father, we pray that you'll take your word as proclaimed tonight that you will use it in each of our hearts to purge us from sin, to give us light and guidance for the path ahead, to give us strength and encouragement, as Paul wrote, that we must through many tribulations enter into the kingdom of God. But help us, Father, to do your will Almost believing is not enough. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen.